just, wasn't it? Yeah, it's just. It was Because uh, we had nine people off, but it's just the way the loading is this morning. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> That's probably best. So remember, Mitchiko, you're the boss. Okay. Tell them what to do. Best of you, um, you're welcome to purchase your lunch on the boat. Either way, lunch will be served on board the vessel. Now, I'll remind uh, under 300 kilometres, okay? Now, that's one way. We still have to bring you home. That's the plan, isn't it? Um, we drive home exactly the same way we drive in, and that's because there's no other option. There's no other road. We're going to... Um, by the time we get everyone home, you would have travelled 600 kilometres. So, it's a big day today, guys, um, particularly when you consider all the beautiful scenery uh, and the sights that we have to do later on. So, because of that once your boat cruise is complete we will leave Morford almost immediately um, and when you get up to exit the coach please walk forward if you're in the front half of the vehicle walk forward walk out the front door and that will enable the people in the rear of the coach to walk forward and walk out the rear door that'll be lovely today this time of the morning it was about 19 degrees it's, it was five, it's five degrees heading leaving town this morning so it is a very chilly start to the day um, the air conditioning is keeping you nice and warm. Um, there's always air blowing onto your window. You can't control that. You can control the overheat. So we're going to drive around the air mountains for about the next hour and a half. You're going to see a lot of mountains today. Okay. And um, of course here in Queenstown, I like to think we've got a beautiful landscape. Gorgeous views. All right. Now, what you guys have to remember though, um, we've got very, very high standards on a day like today. All right. Um, the landscape where we're going, Fjordland, first of all it looks completely different to this, it looks nothing like this, um, but it also looks even more spectacular. It's a real day of contrast when it comes to the mountainous landscape today. That's a good way to describe it actually, it's a real day of contrast. Now speaking of contrast, now the most talked about um, topic that we have when we head to an area like Fjordland definitely the weather conditions and we're talking about the weather at the moment because it's freezing for this time of the year. Um, very unusual in my experience living in Queensland to see any snow, fresh snow on the mountains in February. Sometimes we get a little bit in January, I've seen that quite a bit, but uh, not in February. The weather, look, Milford Sound has a reputation not only for its, uh, for its scenery but also for its weather conditions. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already realise that. Um, it's one of the wettest places in the world at sea level. Rains approximately 200 days a year where we're going. So that doesn't leave so much time for dry conditions, let alone blue sky. Now when it comes to the weather, I say the same thing every morning, no matter what the forecast. And what I say to people is for you guys to get the most enjoyment out of your day. Have a nice relaxed attitude with the weather. Don't make any assumptions. We've got a long drive, a 300 kilometre journey through a number of different climatic zones. Being focused today, but as I've already said, Fjordan looks very different to this. Uh, through here, because of the glaciation, that's why these lakes are typically uh, long and skinny and also very deep. And this lake's no exception, it's the third largest lake in the country. It's 84 kilometres long, so that's approximately 50 miles in length. Now, Queenstown um, roughly built halfway along the entire length of the lake. Okay, so we're heading south. We're driving on the southern portion of the lake.
Now, at higher elevations, the mountains are beginning to mellow. They're starting to get smaller. In about 25 minutes' time, we will leave behind the remains of the hill of mountain country. Now, back down here at road level, instantly the land becomes a lot more productive farming-wise, which is very appropriate. Cell phones are huge, and if you add up all the, uh, all the different parts of uh, farming, I can assure you that farming is still by far the biggest component to New Zealand's economy. And it's pretty difficult not to notice that when you uh, travel around New Zealand, isn't it? Very difficult not to notice it. You'll certainly see lots of uh, farming this morning as we head through to Tiana. Now what I'll do probably in about five minutes time, I'll talk to you a bit more in depth regarding the sheep farming. Still very prevalent in this area that we drive through today. And later on I'll talk to you about one or two uh, quite different forms of farming. Some good examples of uh, the big changes on our farms in fairly recent times. Nice one guys, well very appropriate uh, this area we're driving through, it's called Fairlight. Beautiful. For everybody, but uh, certainly generally speaking here in New Zealand we've got two major types of sheep farms. Now the areas that we drive through this morning, this is the domain of the traditional sheep farm. And some people call them high density farms, simply because the land is relatively productive. Throughout the year there's generally plenty of feed available and that gives the farmer the luxury of farming relatively large numbers of stock for the size of their land. So the land's owned freehold by the farmer. They all vary in size. A fairly typical size of a traditional farm, however, will be around about uh, 200 hectares. That's about 600 acres. They all vary. Now at the moment, guys, through here, um, this is the best condition you'll ever see the farmland for this time of the year. Um, it's been a very changeable summer. We've had a lot of extra rain down through these areas. Um, overall, the farmland's in great condition. Normally, it's a lot more burnt off. You know, it might look burnt off, but it's actually not. Um, no, the, farm, the farmers should be very happy, they've had a huge growing season down, down here anyway this year. Now the sheep out there, um, from the road they look identical, on our traditional farms we are farming crossbred sheep. We've got over 30 different varieties of the crossbred sheep. Now they've always predominantly been farmed for their meat, that's the major form of income for the farmer. There's a variety of sheep meat available, of course. Uh, lamb's the most popular nowadays, which is effectively baby sheep. Uh, lots of lambs out in the fields, but they, they're getting very fat at the moment. And that's how the farmers like it, because unfortunately for the lambs, at the age of about six months, there will be no happy ending. So we're now coming to a junction in the road. This area's called Five Rivers. We have to start to get a bit closer to Fiordland. Now if we were to miss the junction and continue driving straight ahead, uh, in about an hour's time we would arrive in the southernmost city of New Zealand, which is Invercargill. Now to be honest, Invercargill is not the most exciting part of the country and uh, most of you probably won't be going there. We're certainly not going to Invercargill today guys, we certainly are not. Um, we're going to Milford, so uh, once we do turn off here, um, we'll be facing west. We're now going to drive as far west as we can physically go until we collide with the boundary of the Ordland, the township of Tianau, Lake Tianau itself. Now guys, a common question I get this time of the year, um, you'll notice a lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of leafy crops been growing out in the field. Now those leafy crops are simply winter feed for the animals. Now I mentioned before, the farmland's in great condition for this time of the year. Um, the farmers, well, farmers are never happy, are they? But um, they should be very happy this year. It's been a huge growing season, just the way the weather's been. Um, now, down here in the winter, it gets pretty cool, it gets a little bit damp. Uh, the grass basically doesn't grow. So, uh, of course, in the summer, in the growing season, they'll harvest uh, lots of excess grass. Now, this year, the farmers, have, uh, most of them would have already got three cuts, which is amazing, and, and they might even get a fourth their farming. There's a statue of a deer in Mossburg. We've seen a few deer farms already. Uh, you'll see a lot more deer farms closer when we get to Tiana. We are certainly getting a lot closer. Now, coming back to the story, the, the problem they found with shooting the deer with the tranquilizer dart, it was an unforeseen problem. Now, at the best of times, deer are a fairly nervous animal. I'm sure you'll understand being chased by a helicopter 
was potentially quite stressful for the animal. I'm, I'm sure you'll be a bit stressed if you were being chased by a helicopter, so it was no different for the deer. Um, unfortunately, what that meant was a, a small amount, not a huge amount, but an unacceptable amount of the deer were actually dying of heart attacks while they were under the effect of the tranquilizer. Now, the fact that some of them were dying, that defeated the purpose of what the cowboys of the sky were doing, so they needed to develop a new system. In cases they couldn't land, there was no suitable landing areas, so they'd have to hover the machine a few feet above the ground. The co-pilot would jump out, wrestle with the deer, tie its legs together, and rather unceremoniously, the deer would be dangled beneath the helicopter by rope and flown back to a holding area. And that's purely and simply how the deer farming industry in this country has come about now, through the end of April. So what all that means for a small township like Tiana, well, look, it's very simple. When it comes to tourism anyway, uh, its focus is the summer season, okay? Um, during the winter, Tiana quite often resembles a ghost town. But you'll notice as we drive into Tiana very shortly, it's got a very good infrastructure. Um, to handle the, the big influx of visitors that it mostly receives during the summer. Now guys, this time of the day, I can guarantee uh, Tiananmen's humble population of 3,000 people. This time of the day will grow quite dramatically, but only for about 30 or 40 minutes. Lots of people like ourselves going into Milford and ordering the same thing, stopping here for a break uh, before we head up into the mountains. It'll be no different uh, busy summer this year. It's been a bit lean for a few years, of course. But you're all that straight ahead of us. It's on the other side of Lake Tiananmen, so we're very close. Now, if you look over your right-hand shoulder, you'll look up well up to the north. You'll see the mountains up there that we're going to drive up into. So it's still going to take us a good, uh, good 25 minutes until, until we actually enter, enter Fjordland, well up to the north. Nice one. So very good to get that drive out of the way. Of course, we're going to be back this way this evening, the way we've just driven. But look, what we'll do, we'll head up uh, to the main street and uh, we'll go up to the Kiwi Country Complex. That's when we'll park up and let you guys out for a good break. So look, in terms of our departure time, um, we always go by the clock up at the front of the coach here. Okay, That way there's no arguments about time. Now, we want to spend as much time in for your band. You'll have plenty of time here, but we are going to leave at 10.15, quarter past. 15 minutes past 10. So the time you get off, it'll be just over half an hour, guys. Well, just under 35 minutes, okay? Um, now, I do close the doors of the coach up. I'll open up the doors five minutes prior uh, to departure. So you've got plenty of time. Enjoy your break, but I'll open up the bus at, at 10 past. We'll leave... So we're going to drive alongside Lake Tiananmen. Um, when we come around the bend in the road, you'll look over to your left and you'll see the uh, the main part of, of the lake. So the main part of the lake runs north-south. We're at the southern end. If you look over to the lake now, you're looking loosely up to the north and you'll see the mountains that we're going to drive up into. Okay. Now the lake also has three very large arms. They're on the other side. You've got uh, like, well, there's three arms, the south, the middle, and the northern arm. They're like giant tentacles. Officially, they're fjords, which is very rare, guys. So you can see, um, well, there's a good example of the weather today. So there's the wind. We've, we've felt that this morning, haven't we? That's blowing out of the, on the eastern side of the mountains. That's an indication that there's a, a bit more weather on the western side of the mountain. So we are going to have showers, guys. Later on, um, I had a quick look at the webcam. It's showery in Milford. It's coming and going. Um, that's the way it's going to be today. We are going to get a bit of everything. But once we get further into the mountains, we'll, we'll leave most of that wind behind. The wind's more over here. Just one of those is where we're going to today. So you can fly from Milford to Queenstown. Did it? 
That includes two national parks, obviously the Fiordland National Park, um, also the Mount Aspiry National Park. Okay, now the other very popular area is half up the South Island, uh, the Mount Cook region, which also includes the Westland National Park. Now those two different areas I've just mentioned, they're both just as spectacular as each other, okay? They're both just as popular as each other. They look incredibly different, they look very different. What makes the decision though for most people where they actually go and do uh, their second flights is the weather conditions. So the weather is always the most important criteria because that's the Ewington Valley where we're going to go to. But then, um, of course, the bus is facing a different direction now. Now, if you look up, we've got the lake ahead of us, but more up ahead of us, so over to the right there, at 2 o'clock, that's where we're going to head to. But you can see another big gap in the mountains. That's where the lake heads up. And that's where the Milford Track takes people up into Milford. The track officially begins at the head of the lake, but the only way you can get there is by boat. And this little area up ahead, Tiano Downs, is, is where the boat leaves from. So we might see the boat. Um, it might have already left though, but um, the, the boat leaves about this time of the day. Um, it'll be full with hikers. Most people come up to this area by bus. Okay, they'll get dropped off, they'll catch the boat. It's an hour and 15 minute cruise to the head of the lake. From there, people are faced with a uh, 55 kilometre hike, 37 and a half miles, three and a half million acres. Now that sounds impressive. Most people have no idea how big that is, but think of it this way, it's almost 5% of New Zealand's entire land area. Okay, now um, some of you may have visited the Grand Canyon in the United States. Of course, that's a famous area. Um, now the Grand Canyon's are a large national park. Uh, um, now Fiordland's twice the size of the Grand Canyon National Park. So always make a few comparisons between those two areas. Now we're really lucky because we've got the Milford Road. It's going to allow us to, to head through the most rugged, isolated regions of New Zealand. Now most of our national parks, it's quite difficult to get into the most rugged, isolated areas because there's no road access. But in Fiordland, we have one road. Now, remember today when we drive into Milford, um, you're only going to see a tiny part of the National Park, okay? I think a lot of people f um, forget that when they go into Milford, they think they've seen everything. You're only going to see a tiny part of the area. Now look, um, leaving Queensland, I mentioned what a unique uh, mountainous area Fiordland is. It's not your average alpine scenery. That's a good way to describe it. Any other mountains in New Zealand, um, nearly all them, they typically grow to be the tallest of all of our beech trees. Now later on the climate's very different. We're on the dry side of the mountains or the drier side of the mountains. The west coast is the wet coast. So the forest changes over there because the climate's quite different. Over there it's mostly silver and mountain beach. But these are red beech. Um, these trees will uh, mature at the age of three to four hundred years. The oldest trees in this particular forest. Um, getting up to about a thousand years old. So, so good things take time. Temperate rainforest, these are red beach right here.
Yeah. Up down into the lower Hollyford Valley. Now, you, from up here, you can only see a very small part of the lower Hollyford. Um, it'll be pretty moody. Um, the wind, you can see the wind blowing up the valley because it's coming up from the coast. All right, um, but it drops away quite dramatically here, and you might even get a lovely photograph from the coast. Let's see how we go. You'll see it drops away uh, very shortly. There we go. So basically as far as you can see, the valley takes a abrupt left-hand bend and, and then it heads down to the ocean, a place called Martins Bay. We can't see that far. So the fact that there's a big patch of blue sky above us is a good sign for our driver. You know, uh, there is weather coming later on. Probably be heavy rain later uh, after we've gone on site. We should avoid that. But there we go. There's the, uh, just a very quick glimpse of the lower Hollyford Valley. So essentially what we're going to do from here, we're just going to, uh, we're going to do, so we'll be uh, um, driving along the bottom of these cliffs. So the cliff faces will rise vertical up to about a thousand metres. And uh, it's well beyond the cliffs, mostly out of view from down here, the, where the mountains sit very rugged, very majestic. Okay, so a lot of permanent snow and ice up there, but we can't see it. Even if it was a perfect day, you wouldn't see it from down here because of these big cliffs. They block a lot of our view. Um, so, of course today is a bit of weather guys, a bit of weather coming and going, don't forget to look up, it's very important from here on. And if you look up the valley, it's, um, you'll notice it's starting to get a lot more rock solid. The vegetation from now on is going to find it a lot more difficult to attach themselves uh, to, the rock, to the rock faces. So when you get that solid rock combined with huge amount of rainfall, um, the, the potential for waterfall activity is astounding. So, you know, a day like today, you'll see a few waterfalls, but they'll be little ones mostly, and they'll be very small. Um, mm. Now, guys, your best waterfall photography, typically that's out on the boat cruise, okay? So the skipper of the boat will typically manoeuvre the vessel right underneath a good-sized waterfall. Right underneath it. So just be aware of that if you're out on the uh, the viewing deck of the boat on the bow. Waterfalls in this part of the world tend to be very wet and cold. All right. Some people like to get drenched, but uh, there is the option. Do you believe in the waterfalls. Um, now, this is the high part of our drive. Once we get to the edge, to the tunnel, we are going to be uh, 970 metres above sea level. So it's going to be a little bit cooler out there. Almost a thousand metres, about 3,300 uh, 3, feet. Now, I think we'll have to keep you on the bus. We're not going to be here for long by the look of it. I'm just looking at the sign. They're saying large vehicle exiting. That's a new one. They've been upgrading the uh, the signage on the tunnel lately, so I haven't seen that sign before. But look, I think we'll have to keep you on the coach because I'm anticipating we're going to get a green light to go through. A bit of a story about the tunnel, actually. I'll talk about that once we go in. Buried under huge amounts of snow, and uh, where we are now, this is one of the worst areas for avalanches on the Milford Road. Um, at least once a winter, this whole area here will be covered under massive amounts of avalanche debris. And it all comes down from the left, um, well beyond those waterfalls. The Mount Bell is a big mountain peak, way up above out of sight. And basically the avalanche gets airborne and it smashes into the ground right here. So we'll farewell the upper Hollyford Valley. 
Now, they want most people notice when they get into the tunnel, it's a very primitive tunnel system. Very primitive indeed. Now, we're 970 metres above sea level, we, we now start to go downhill. So the tunnel's got a gradient of 1 in 10. It's 1,270 metres long. We won't be underground for too long. Now, this is officially a two-lane road. Now, the, the tunnel's actually quite wide at the moment. See the sign, the passing bay. Um, but it will get a lot narrower. For most of its working life, this tunnel's been um, a two-lane road. Okay, but of course we were waiting for the traffic lights. A bit of a story as to why it's got traffic lights. I mean, now that we're in here, you can probably work out it's quite narrow. Um, the width of the road's okay, it's the roof that's the problem. So if you're in a high side of vehicle like a, like a bus or a camper van, if you move over too far, there's potential to do a lot of damage to your vehicle. Okay, now... The tunnel opened in 1954. This was the last piece of the road to be complete. All right. For most of its life, it was a two-way two traffic. Um, Fifteen years ago, the authorities detected a growing trend. Now, what? Um, now there is enough room if we're careful. I'd slow down. I'd move right over. Um, unfortunately, some caravan drivers were getting a bit carried away, and they were forgetting about the size of their vehicle, the roof, and they were moving over too far, scraping up against the uh, socket. Uh, solid rock roof of the tunnel. So the authorities wanted to eliminate that issue. The most simple cost-effective solution was simply to install traffic lights. Now these days the traffic lights uh, control the tunnel year-round. Uh, hop out and who knows what the weather's doing over here. It might be better, it might be worse, but look, it's a different environment over here. It's a stunning view and I suggest to people that you look up and down because we're now going to drive the entire length of the Cliddow Valley. So that's a Welsh name, Clidai. Means the sword. So we'll see a few more waterfalls over here. So there is a bit of cloud sitting right in the middle there, but we can see, um, we'll see bits. It's going to come and go, guys. But um, you can just see the road down below, and what we'll do, we'll duck out of that cloud shortly. You can just see, look up back behind you, guys. Yeah. Don't forget to look up, look all around. There we go, the Cladow Valley. There's, there's some Kias there. Just see on the side of the road, see oh, yeah. the Kias? Yeah. So they're just sort of hanging there because people get stopped by the red light. They're hoping someone's going to feed them. Hopefully we'll see some Kias where we're going here shortly. So we follow this valley all the way down to the ocean. It's actually not far. About a 20-minute drive. I think why Milford is such a cool place where we're going. You know, the scenery we'll, we'll see driving down in the valley. We will see some scenery in a bit of cloud at night, but we will see plenty of scenery. Down in Milford, it's, it's remarkably similar, but uh, the big difference in Milford, it's a massive difference, is that you're going to.
all the damage right through fear of land, all that seal power, get all that check. That's just a good example of what they look like. It's not, uh, we're almost into autumn shortly, but um, no, it should, looks like a pretty nice night out there actually. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you will be looking forward to a beer or a wine. It's almost beer o'clock. A lot of you are probably looking forward to a feed as well. So it won't be too long. Um, from here uh, we've got about, uh, oh, about six and a half kilometres to go back into town. Alright, so now with the drop-offs tonight, uh, they shouldn't take too long actually. The order will do things. Uh, in a few minutes we'll have our first drop-off at the Rees. Um, then we're going to go uh, further into town to the, uh, the Copthorne Apartments. And then we'll go around the corner.